Welcome everyone to our webinar, um, Invasive Species and Development. Today we are joined by Peter Watson from the RPS Group. Peter is an associate ecologist and has extensive experience within the ecology sector, spe specialising in invasive species, providing invasive species assessments, management plans, remediation strategies and a control for range of species primarily to support development. A variety of legislation on the prevention and management of invasive alien plant and animal species exists in the UK and in this webinar today it will provide an introduction to those species and frequently present a sorry to those species that frequently present a constraint to the development. As always there'll be a chance to ask questions at the end of your presentation so please do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation and I will ask these on your behalf later. Thank you for logging in and I'll now hand over to Peter. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Derek, um, and welcome and, and thank you all for joining us. Um, and oh, there we go. Sorry, the, uh, the the next button wasn't playing up there. So um, Derek's already given us a, a bit of an introduction. I, I was to be joined by a colleague today, but unfortunately, she hasn't been able to make it. So overall, looking at the, the presentation outline, um, we'll... Uh, We'll look at some of the terminology surrounding invasive non-native species and, and what that might mean. Uh, we'll have a look over the legislation uh, and guidance, uh, and then we'll then we'll kind of look in depth at, at some of this in, invasive flora and fauna. So we're we're not going to. This isn't a Japanese knotweed presentation, although yep, we'll certainly cover that. Um, we'll try and give you a bit more of a flavour of of some of the other species that that also cause uh, issues in development. We'll also look at the impacts um, and, and how we address those. So uh, starting off then, what exactly are non-native species or invasive non-native species? Um, as, as I just mentioned, there's a lot of terminology surrounding um, aliens. Um, basically, we need to look at the, the initials native or non-native. So obviously native is a species that um, occurs within its, within a, a set geographical area and non-native is something that's been brought in usually through anthropogenic means. Um, we've got the terms there, INS and, and NINS. So invasive non-native species and uh, non-native invasive species, it's basically the same thing. Um, introduced species, exotics, there's, there's lots of species in the UK that are introduced, they're non-native, they're not necessarily invasive. So it's 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 those terms together, so non-native and invasive, uh, causing a problem. We also cover quite quite frequently what what we term species of of concern. So these may be native species, um, so they they've got every right to be there, but they can cause problems um, in development. Uh, for instance, things like budlia, um, butterfly bush. Um, Probably most people are, are familiar with that plant. Um, you often see it growing out of the top of gutters, you know, growing out of masonry, um, where it can it can cause structural damage. Um, also, field horsetail. Um, that species can push up through tarmac or usually paved areas, somewhere where there's not a, a very substantial sub base. So, so we do cover off more than just non-native species. So, well. We'll have a quick look at the legislation. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, just give you the headlines, really. So the, the primary piece of legislation that, that oversees or, or, or covers invasive species is the Wildlife and Countryside Act, uh, and in particular, Section 14, um, which sets out within within Section 14, we have Schedule, Schedule 9 species. And that's a list of species that are currently um legislated for you know there's an, a legal imperative for for a landowner a client or a developer to to actually deal with them uh, the the epa also uh, that sets out um classification of of contaminated materials um and the there's a word in there i don't know if you can see that proper gills so proper gills they're anything that the, the plant can spread by so whether that's roots rhizomes seeds uh, and, it, and it's materials containing that type of plant material that would allow the plant to grow that are, that are classified as controlled waste. 
Um, there's a whole other uh, battery of, of legislation there, the pesticides regulation, um, the Weeds Act, uh, and various various other pieces there. We also have uh, EU regulation. Um, and within that, there is also another uh, list of, of EU-wide species that are that are also designated. So, so what's interesting there is is the is the paragraph in bold, uh, which again comes from the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, it it shall be a defence to a charge of committing an offence to prove that the accused took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence to avoid committing the offence. So, so what's key about that is recognize if invasive species are present recognizing that assessing assessing that risk um and putting something in place to show that you know the the, the presence of invasive species is being addressed so we'll we'll now have a look at, at some of these uh, invasive plants uh, and animals so um this is uh, oak processionary moth um it occasionally pops up in the headlines. Um, it's not so much the moth, but the caterpillars that, that cause a problem. This isn't actually a listed Schedule 9 invasive species. Um, however, it is invasive. Um, it, it first came in into the UK around 2005, um, and it was it was located in London. Um, since then, it's, it's spread out. It's spread into the uh, home counties and, and beyond. Uh, and the problem with the species is the is the caterpillar. So the caterpillar has fine hairs on, um, which which can present a health and safety risk, um, and they can also lead to defoliation of of the oak tree, which allows not necessarily kills the oak tree, but allows other pathogens to enter the tree and 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 can actually kill oak trees. Um, so for that, the Forest Commission um, issued a quarantine pest. Um, alert and um, they have quarantine zones where landowners have an obligation to to deal with oak processionary moth where it's present. One of my uh, favorite slides, midwife toads, they, they are so cool. <laughs> uh, but there are schedule nine invasive species. Um, what's interesting about these are that they're not spreading, so they're not uh, rapidly spreading. So they're not highly invasive. Um, and this was these were photographs taken a couple of years ago in, in Bedford, um, where the initial populations um, were released into the wild. Uh, what's interesting is the tadpole. You can see that's that's my hand there. Um, they remain in the ponds for 18 months or so um, and do all of their growing in the pond. So by the time they, they leave the pond, they're pretty much the size of an adult there. Uh, they are spreading up. Well, they they have spread up the country. Um, there's populations uh, up near Sheffield, and there's a small population in Whitby that I'm aware of. But um, it's believed that they were deliberate introductions. So the the star of the show, Japanese knotweed. So obviously, as the as the name infers, uh, originated in Japan. Uh, it's been in in the UK for a, a long time now, and and it was relatively quickly recognised uh, as invasive. Um, it's it's all a single plant in the UK, so it, it doesn't spread through seed. Japanese knotweed in the UK spreads through rhizome fragments, um, and to a lesser extent stem fragments, um, but primarily through the rhizome. Uh, we've got a a, a small stem there with the the leaves to give you the idea so we generally refer to it as a heart-shaped leaf with a flat back um so you can see there on the uh the the top left leaf it's quite quite flat along the back um it is easily mistaken for for other species um we get red dogwood we get uh bindweed um but usually once you actually look at it a little closer you you can you can make the, you know, see the differences. So you'll see on the stem there, the stem zigzags slightly between the between the leaves. So where there's a leaf, we call that a leaf node, um, and you you can see the zigzag pattern on there. Uh, we also come across giant or or hybrid knotweed. Um, the picture on the left there, you you can see it's uh, a substantially larger leaf. 
Um, it makes makes no dis difference uh, as far uh, as far as the legislation's um, concerned. So giant hogweed, hybrid knotweed, and Japanese knotweed, uh, they're all listed on Schedule Nine. So uh, Japanese knotweed, you you can identify it um, at, at all times of the year. Um, the issues tend to be if there's been any vegetation clearance or, or anything like that, then that could impact whether whether uh, the plant's visible. Uh, we've got a, a piece of rhizome there as well, and and um, w while that's that's certainly indicative of what you might find, we certainly wouldn't recommend anybody tries to dig it up to have a look at the at the rhizome to see if uh, see if that matches um, your idea of knotweed. Um, you. You also get crown material at the base. So the, the top left left picture there is a, a very hard woody um, material from which the, the shoots come out with. Crown material tends to develop uh, as the plant matures. So, you know, if you if it's a young plant, one, two, three stems, you're unlikely to have crown crown material develop like that. But what you can see if it's a if it's a large mature plant is there's the little round rings on that on that crown material where old canes you know from previous years they've grown up they've snapped off they've, they've blown down over time and you're left with very much like a, an octopus sucker you know like a, a small round rings uh, on the material quite an interesting picture um along with this slide so um, what we have there is Japanese knotweed early in the year. It's probably around May time this. Uh, and you can get a, a, a white, a pair of white lines on the, on the leaf. Um, what that usually is an indication of is that the plant's under stress. So I've heard, I've heard it said, you know, well, you can see that this plant's been treated by herbicide before. And, and yes, that can be the case, but Little, little note of caution because you know a frost later on in the spring as the plants beginning to grow can also um, uh, make this type of marks on the leaves so uh, we've got a, a list of the of the control approaches um, which is is usually dictated by um, what the plans are for the site so you know is, is the development planned is it a commercial area is it is it spreading from the boundary you know is, is there a need to to remove the plant altogether from the site. Um, herbicide application, that's that's usually the most cost, cost effective approach. Um, but there are obviously, a, you know, a, a whole list of, of different methods of control there. Um, usually if it's a residential development um, at, at the point of selling plots or conveyancing, the, they don't want any Japanese knotweed legacy on that, on that site that could cause an issue at at the point of sale. So, you know, for residential, it's usually removal into landfill. But there, there are various uh, methods in between there that may or may not be appropriate depending on, on the plans for the site. So just drilling down into excavation removal to landfill. Um, so looking at the, uh, the, the graphic down at the, uh, the bottom right there, you could have a plant one meter by one meter. Now that it's not what's above ground that's the issue, uh, it, it's what's below ground. That's where your contaminated material, where the, ry the rhizome sits. Now this graphic is is based on uh, old guidance. Um, originally, the Environment Agency um, suggested seven meters, so a seven meter horizontal and a three meter vertical. Um, in reality, it, it, it's less. It's usually less than that. So we kind of work on a on an assumption of probably two meters by two meters. It, it depends. A, a lot of different factors feed into that. Um, so there can be some differences. Um, excavation removal to landfill. It really should be reviewed as a last resort. Um, nice picture above there as well. Uh, this was uh, up in Bradford a few years ago. Um, the development next door, student accommodations, and it was pretty much surrounded by Japanese knotweed. So it really did not look like um, it had been dealt with prior to that development. So um, this is um, the RICS guidelines. 
So the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors um, for Japanese knotweed, primarily for the surveyors and the valuers. Um, this is the, the old guidance. So what happened back in uh, 2019, just noticed uh, we've got the digits the wrong way around at the bottom there for the Common Select Committee. So the Common Select Committee um, looked into Japanese knotweed in the built environment. Um, there was a lot of concern about mortgages being uh, refused and, and zero valuations on properties. Um, and um, I don't know if anyone's done it, but if you Google Japanese knotweed, there's, there's so many horror stories out there. So, so this was the old RICS uh, guidelines. Um, what happened was following the select committee's uh, uh, report that was published, um, RICS changed their guidance. So this was updated in 2022. Um, and they've adopted a much more management-based approach whereas the, the previous guidance was risk-based. Um, and it, it seems to have settled things in the, in the mortgage provider um, market, certainly. And there are still occasions where uh, surveyors need to get involved and, and we do produce on a, on a fairly frequent basis, um, letter reports setting out why something may not be an issue for, uh, for the conveyance of a property or, or recommendations for further work to, to manage the Japanese knotweed. <clears throat> a bit of an extreme example here. So this was uh, a site down in uh, Catford, uh, London, a few years ago. And, and this was a, a, a stand of Japanese knotweed that was probably only a, a meter, a meter and a half by a meter, very small. Um, unfortunately, it was at the top of a um, canalized section of river, um, concrete, concrete base, concrete walls. Um, and there had to be substantial amount of support and uh, access um, put in to be able to get in there to remove it. And it's just an example of, you know, how these things can, uh, can spiral. And you need to look at where, where the plant is to be able to uh, formulate an, an approach and a management. Uh, and as I was talking uh, earlier about the, the seven metres by three metres rule that, that isn't necessarily a rule anymore, uh, this was a site up in Manchester um, and you've got, you've got the uh, topsoil there and uh, it's probably about 1.2 metres and you're, you're hitting, uh, hitting clays. So the Japanese knotweed was, was relatively easy to deal with. It was a very large stand, um, but it, it didn't penetrate down into the clay layer at all. Moving on to another interesting plant, giant hogweed. I mean, it's um, it's a very impressive plant. If you if you see it, you know, up to five meters tall. Uh, usually found along uh, watercourses, streams, rivers. Um, it, it will it will encroach away from that um, uh, wet woodland areas and things like that. But generally, it's associated with watercourses. Um, a giant hogweed that produces solely from seed, um, but it's prolific. Um, and what's interesting about giant hogweed is um, this this flower that you can see there. Um, this is usually produced in kind of year four, year five of the plant's development, after which it will die. So, you know, year one, you might have a single leaf going out of the ground. And even up to year three, you, you may only have three or four leaves, a relatively short plant. Um, probably 60 centimetres, 80 centimetres, that type of height. So it's it's very often overlooked and, until you get these uh, really large flower spikes. Um, also, I don't know if, if some people may have seen on the news that the issue with giant hogweed, not only is it an invasive non-native species and listed on Schedule 9, um, that the sap can cause sphere blistering. Um, and, and one of the problems with that is it, it doesn't burn immediately. So it, you may get the, the sap or, or even brushing against the plant and there'll be no immediate reaction. The, the reaction will occur um, the next day or later that day. And it's when the skin is then exposed to sunlight, the reaction takes place and blistering occurs in some cases quite severely. relatively easy plant to deal with um, particularly when it's um, low numbers 
a um, little bit trickier when you when you have um, very dense areas of, of knotweed uh, and access can cause a problem for that with it being on river banks it can be quite tricky you're looking at steep slopes uh, and things like that so herbicide application that's that's very effective um, particularly in the younger plants um, taproot cutting uh, that's quite good uh, a spade just below the ground um, through at a, a 45 degree angle if you sever the uh, the tap root then you know that will kill the plant um the, the, one of the problems with this is is obviously the toxicity and the and the the, the possibility of getting burned so really it, it should be a professional that that deals with that but there's um there's various other methods of control that we've got there deep plowing that's uh plowing the area beneath uh up to a depth of about 50 centimeters because um, the seed bank is usually quite shallow. Um, again, excavation, um, hand pulling. Hmm, yeah, I mean that that is in the in the books as as one of the methods. But again, precautions need to be taken. Um, and and looking at the bottom there, um, a catchment approach may be required. Um, with it being on watercourses, it's all well and good treating treating an individual site, but what's upstream? Um, are you just going to get inundated with uh, seeds from plants upstream? So it, it may be more of a management approach rather than uh, an eradication. Himalayan balsam, um, a, a, another interesting plant. It's it's uh, very pretty, orchid-like flowers, um, but it, it, it outcompetes all native vegetation. Um, you know, you get dense stands of them along along watercourses again. So it's another it's another wet ground lover. Um, rivers, streams, wet woodlands, but it's a little bit more tolerant to drier areas than giant hogweed. So it will move out, and you see it in verges, and you know, often hundred meters, maybe more away from the watercourse. So you know, it can it can tolerate drier drier um, living conditions. Um, it spreads through seed um, and it has little seed pods on there. So in the top right hand corner, you can see them a small kind of. I'm not sure what, what how I would describe the, the, the shape of those, but when they when they mature, if they're brushed against or touched or, or, or windy day, the, the seed capsules explode, releasing their seeds. Um, one of the issues with it is that it's suppressing the growth of, of native plants um, and Himalayan balsam dies back at the at the end of the year. Um, once you start getting the first frosts, the, uh, the stems pretty much melt. So they're, they're a very wet stem uh, and, the, and the frost kills them very rapidly. And you get a few weeks where it looks like there's a bit of straw on the ground. And a couple of weeks after that, there's there's no sign of it. So this is a plant that really can only be identified in the growing season. Uh, control hand pulling. So hand pulling is is something that a lot of the uh, wildlife organisations, NGOs, wildlife trusts employ. Um, the difference between uh, organisations like that and uh, commercial clients is is they have a, a big battery of you know a large group of volunteers on hand to assist in this type of thing um machine cutting strimming you know that's quite an effective way um but it has to be cut between the lowest node uh, as we mentioned about japanese knotweed the node is is where the first leaf appears so it's a it's a leaf node if, if it's cut above that um the plant will regrow from the from the leaf node um, herbicide that's uh, that's uh, very effective, but you would need an extended period of, of herbicide. So you you the plants will germinate if temperatures allow April more like more into May, and and plants will germinate throughout the growing season. So a single treatment in June, well th there'll be new plants uh, emerged. Um, so usually we say four or five applications on a monthly basis and, you know, kind of see how the how the weather conditions are. Uh, and the key the key thing on this is to replant um, where the plants die off in winter. If they're on a river bank, you, you've suddenly got an exposed bank um, susceptible to erosion, uh, washing sediment into into watercourses. It can affect 
fish stocks, um, you know, reducing breeding and things like that, and and uh, cause issues for the for the water course. Uh, Crassia, or uh, New Zealand pygmy weed. So, so this was introduced as a a, a pond oxygenating plant uh, for garden ponds, um, and it's and it forms dense impenetrable mats. So it, you can get it in in all forms. It'll be aquatic, it'll be marginal, uh, it'll be growing out of the water or emergent, um, and it's it's very tricky to to deal with. There um, there used to be a um, a herbicide that was effective i think that was banned several decades ago now um and and to be honest the recommendation is usually if if at all possible fill fill the pond in and and dig a new one because it's just so hard to to deal with um ongoing management um we've had several over the years where you've put in management protocols and maybe some some planting um and play with the the water levels um, there are ways to manage it, but it's um, it's it's very difficult to uh, to get rid of. Although um, I'm not sure where they're at, but CABI, um, an organisation that develops um, control, um, is looking at a, a crassula weevil, I think, which is what they've done for water fern. Um, so water fern, there you can you can now get something called the azola weevil. It's been around a few years. And you can, uh, if you have water fern, uh, water fern, invest in a, a water course or a, usually a ditches and systems like that tend to tend to be susceptible because there's less movement. Um, you can uh, contact Cabby and buy a box of weevils. <laughs> um, it's quite a cool way to deal with it. And uh, floating pennywort, uh, another aquatic weed. So this was down on the Thames, um, and it forms very dense uh, mats of vegetation. So it, it, it impacts navigation, it impacts the oxygenation of the water, um, and outcompetes native uh, native vegetation. So it's uh, it, it's classed there as crit critical risk classification. So it's been banned from sale since 2014, um, and again, eradication is difficult. Um, but there are some very good specialist companies that use a combination of mechanical removal, follow-up spot treatment. Uh, I know they, I was at the Invasive Weed Conference last week and uh, the Canal and River Trust um, has had some success in, in dealing with this on a, on a catchment approach. Um, so it's very interesting stuff. And, and back to one of the species of concern, so field horsetail native species uh highly invasive and as you can see from the the photograph on the top right there that's pushing up through uh a, a tarmac uh car park this was um and, and these are the um the early spring growth of horsetail so they it has two forms of growth uh, it puts this stem up very asparagus looking um and this is where it will set spores from um, later on in the year, you get more of the leafy variation. So the bottom left there, um, it's kind of a, a fern looking plant. Uh, so yeah, it can cause structural damage. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to control. Um, but it's, but it's a native species. So, you know, what's a weed? Well, it, it's, it's a plant that's, uh, in the, in the wrong place or unwanted, you know, we don't want it where it's growing in that type of environment. So um, going back to the identification of Japanese knotweed before we move on to impacts, uh, this is often what you find when you're looking for Japanese knotweed on site. So this is a, a, a winter picture of Japanese knotweed. And you can see how tricky it would be to identify that. Um, everything's dead. It's just a few stems up against a palisade fence. It's it, it, it's very tricky. So so looking at the impacts. So so the impacts of uh, invasive species. So it impacts to biodiversity, um, delays to development, drainage functions. Um, in, for some species, there can be hazards to built structures. 
Um, and as we've mentioned, riverbank stability, uh, giant hogweed, we've got health hazards um, and the oak processionary moth um, and, and the risk of, of clients, landowners breaching uh, legislation. Uh, and of course, the financial burden of actually dealing with these species. So um, they, the, the most recent um, research that was done um, was done by Cabby in 2021. Uh, I'm just conscious I've mentioned CABI a few times now and, and not really described what they are. So the Centre for Agriculture and Biosciences International. Um, so they, they work on, on a, a range of invasive plants and species and, and how to manage them often in um, food producing countries, you know, pests that attack uh, uh, agricultural crops and that type of thing. So, so they've estimated 5 billion as the cost of invasive species to the UK over the last 40 to 50 years. Um, some of the other figures there are, uh, are, are quite old now, um, but it just gives you an indication of how much money is actually spent dealing with this type of species. Um, and, the, and the photograph on the right there, that's Japanese knotweed, probably uh, around May time. So initially very much like the field horsetail you'll get an, an asparagus looking spike um, and then the leaves will unfurl from that so site assessment and management again there's a the picture there again that's another picture of, of what we often encounter you know it's it, it's not your typical lovely stand of japanese knotweed in flower um this is a what, what was a very large stand of Japanese knotweed and the only growth you've got there now is in the foreground you can see there's a small patch of green and that's what we call bonsai growth of Japanese knotweed so it's been hit with herbicide um, probably a few times um, it, it may have been a bit too strong I mean you, sometimes you'd get bonsai growth and you know it's that's just the way it's responded um, but it's it's a, a a much smaller version of the plant with very small um, twisted leaves, so it's it doesn't fit your your normal Japanese knotweed leaf shape. So the key thing is uh, to get specialist advice, um, exclude the area, make sure everyone's aware um, that that you've got a potential invasive species, and you know we need to be careful around that to make sure we don't spread it. Um, restricting vegetation management. Um, as we've said, Japanese knotweed primarily um, spreads through rhizome fragments, but it, it can spread through stem fragments. If you have two leaf nodes, um, in, in theory, and given optimum conditions, uh, that, that fragment could grow. You need to restrict the movement of soil um, from an invest uh, infested site, and you make, need to make sure that plant and machinery isn't, isn't driving over that running the risk of, of spreading the plant further around the site. So who should be uh, who should be making these assessments? Well, I've, I've put suitably experienced ecologist. Um, absolutely, that's uh, that's my background. But there are there are a plethora of invasive species specialists out there and contractors. Um, very knowledgeable with some great experience you know so just somebody who who understands um and it, it, if you go in if you there's lots of companies out there that deal with japanese knotweed but are they capable of recognizing some of these other species um many of which are also on schedule nine and you've got just as much of an obligation to deal with them you need to look at seasonality um you should map the species uh, and create a management plan so that you You've got to, you know how you're going to deal with the species going forward. Uh, that management plan should cover all the control options, the recommendations, uh, a remediation strategy if it's needed, um, and, and provide information on warranty and guarantee if, if, that, if that's required. So we have there uh, uh, some, of the more, some more species that are listed on Schedule 9 there. And I'm, I'm at the end. I uh, I wasn't sure how I was doing time-wise. So uh, yeah. thank you very much for your time. Um, 
I'll pass you back over to Derek. Perfect. Um, yeah, great timing. Um, we do have a couple of questions, so I'll just get straight into them. And just a reminder, if anyone does have any questions, just pop them in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the first question here is: How difficult is it to monitor the spread of Japanese knotweed? To so the monitor spread, the spread speed of Japanese knotweed. Well, ag again, that's a it's a very tricky question that because it really depends on the the environment it's it's within. You know access to um moisture and you know the everything that helps japanese knotweed grow um so yeah it, it, it's generally the the initial phase of establishment is is pretty slow so once it's first introduced it, it can sit there for five ten years and, and it may only be one or two stems and and then it will it will hit a curve where it's it's found its it's found its roots. It's got itself established, and and then it will look to spread. But there's there's no hard and fast rule, unfortunately. Okay, perfect. Um, so there's a question here as well about the um, the horsetail. Um, so what is the issue with the horsetail? Structural damage to concrete, etc. Um, and note, it often on land that has been stripped for development but left undeveloped yeah so i mean the problem's twofold so i i heard concrete mentioned there it, it won't grow through concrete um and and japanese not weed will either really you know they, it might utilize existing expansion gaps and things like that but um i haven't seen it break through concrete yet um the the problem is yes damage to uh, soft landscaping and hard landscaping but not so much roads but pathways anything with a you know shallow sub base um, and and it can be unsightly you know you've got a development you've put in green spaces and and field horse, horse tail work can take over you know so so that's kind of where the uh, imperative comes to deal with it I mean um, and you said in the presentation that it was difficult to control um what how can you remove the the horsetail like what's the plan for it to be removed yeah well there, there has been some successes with um uh, there's a natural plant-based acid um which uh, mixed with uh, glyphosate um has been shown to have some success that's still in trials at the moment um there are a few herbicides out there that are um specifically developed for horsetail um but it's 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 very much like japanese knotweed so you know herbicide you don't just spray these plants and it's gone forgotten you know it can often take a number of years you know you could be looking at three to five years for both species um to achieve control I mean, just talking about um, glyphosate, um, someone said here that we have a lot of Ganera giant rhubarb. Um, is glyphosate spraying the only real method for removal? Um, I'm I'm not sure. I mean, that's that's not a plant I've had to deal with um, personally. Um, but there's there's um, some very good information out there. Um, there's a, an organisation that we're a member of called the Property Care Association, and that's the Trade Association for Invasive Weeds. Um, and there's a they've got an excellent book um, which does have a chapter on that um, listing the the control methods. So so yes, I, I would say glyphosate probably is is effective. Um, I'm pretty sure it is, but that, that would need to be checked. Uh, and the other implication is if that's another um, species that's attracted to water courses or damp areas, um, anything on a water course, you need to get consent from the environment agency um, if it's within a meter of the top of the bank. So, you know, it's and it, it should be treated professionally. It shouldn't be undertaken by uh, individuals. Thank you. Um, someone's asking here, where can you report Himalayan balsam to um, the Canal and River Trust? I don't know if that's one that you can. Yeah, I mean, if it if it's um, part of their land hold, holding, um, I'm sure they'd be very interested to know. There there are a few apps out there. Um, I can't think what it's called off the top of my head. So the the there is a, a particular invasive weed um, plant app. It's not not plant net. Um, if perhaps um, I can feed back yeah, the information you to yourself, other, Derek. Can... Yeah. And I can distribute that. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so the next question here then is from Sean, and it's, are there any known biological control agents for Crassula? Um, 
I, I'm not sure. I need to I need to check that again myself because I know Cabby were developing something um, and I haven't heard anything about that for a, for a year or two now. So I need to have a look at that. Um, I'm sure it's in development. I'm not sure anything's been released yet. Perfect. Thank you. Um, is it possible to test soil samples for seeds, rhizomes, etc., say in the instance of importing soils? Um no so we used to do something called uh rhizome viability testing um but that was many years ago and it tends not to be done anymore um we do uh trial pits and you know you might do excavations to look at to try and determine the extent of a below ground growth so that you know the volumes if you're if you're removing material from a site um but no i think i think the key thing is to make sure that any any material sourced or imported into a site has come from a, you know, um, a, a respectable or a, you know, a, a, a good source, and it's not just uh, whatever's cheap. <laughs> um, someone's asking here, what is the trigger or threshold for a species to become a as to become a registered invasive? Um, so it's uh, it's currently all based on risk assessments, and there can be a number of reasons why a plant makes it onto onto Schedule Nine in particular. Um, you know, there's there's obviously the impacts to development, structural issues, um, but for instance, we've got things like Cotoneasters on Schedule Nine, um, and Cotoneaster is frequently used throughout soft landscaping in you know commercial developments and things like that. Um, but they were causing a problem on Forest Commission land, um, National Trust, wildlife parks, thing, you know, sensitive areas of conservation. Um, so for that reason, Katoni Aster uh, made it to Schedule 9. So it, it could it's just based on a risk assessment, really. Fantastic. Um, do, you th do you know if CRISPR or gene editing is being used to combat invasive species in the UK? Um, no, not that I'm aware of. Perfect. Um, and someone's asking a question here. Now that we've left the EU, will it severely affect efforts to monitor and regulate invasive species coming to the UK? Um, no, I, 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 not necessarily. Um, there's some quite strict rules, particularly um, given the uh, tree diseases that have been imported. You know, so so you know it is something that that all countries, not just the EU, the UK government, uh, you know, it's got some quite strict criteria within for the importation of trees, for instance. So, so no, and and currently the EU legislation it was all just put over into UK law. Uh, I, I know we're going to lose some of that, um, but I I think that we do have those uh, checks and balances in place. Right, and we've just got one more question. Um, what is your view on the effect of climate change and the number of different invasive invasives, their spread and resistance to management? Yeah, well, I mean that's uh, that's a, a huge factor, isn't it, on <laughs> on uh, on whether invasive species can establish or not. Um, I would assume that yes, we, it, it's going to create a, a whole new set of circumstances where plants that you know maybe just a few decades ago couldn't establish in the UK because it was out of its climatic range. So so yeah, that it, it could be a, a huge factor going forward. Fantastic. Thank you, Peter. Um, and Peter's contact details are on the screen. And for anyone that does have any additional questions, and like I say, we will share the details of the app that was mentioned during the presentation. Um, so thank you to Peter. Um, that's it from us today, attendees. Thank you for logging in. I hope you found it beneficial and informative.